Please take your Bibles and turn back to that passage of Scripture which we read just a few moments ago, Exodus chapter 15, beginning in verse 22. As you know, we're looking at the ten times that the Jews rebelled against God in their wilderness wanderings, and uh, we are seeing why God chose each one of those instances as a point in the death penalty for all of the adult Jews who left Egypt. Rather serious because each one of the tests that Israel faced during the wilderness wanderings is a test that you and I face at some time during our life. And the New Testament tells us that these things were written as examples for us so that we wouldn't fall into the same kind of sins that Israel fell into. So it is rather serious when we look at these different instances because they may be keys to whether or not we will live. Now, last time together in Exodus, we continued part two of the new material that I had added, that fear is the opposite of faith. And I gave you two memory verses, Psalm 56.3 and Psalm 56.4, what time I am afraid, I will trust in thee. I hope you at least memorize that one. And the verse 4, in God I will praise his word. In God have I put my trust. I will not fear what flesh can do unto me. Very good verses. That was point number one. Now, fear is a tool that the devil almost always uses to get you to rebel against God. Remember that. There were five things we learned. That's the first. Fear is the tool that the devil almost always uses to get you to rebel against God. We saw that in 2 Timothy 1.7. God hath not given us the spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. Number two, we saw that fear has bad consequences. Very bad consequences. But faith always has good consequences. The fear of man bringeth a snare. There's the bad consequence. But whoso putteth his trust in the Lord shall be safe. There's the good consequence. The third lesson that we learned was there's an important contrast between the fear of man, which is always bad, and the fear of the Lord, which is always good. Job tells us, And unto man he said, Behold the fear of the Lord, that is wisdom, and apart from evil is understanding. Psalm 19, you all know about Psalm 19. The fear of the Lord is clean, enduring forever. The judgments of the Lord are righteous altogether. Psalm 111, The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. A good understanding have all they that do his commandments. His praise endureth forever. Proverbs is loaded with the fear of the Lord. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge, but fools despise wisdom and instruction. That's 1, 7, 9, 10. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. Knowledge of the holy is understanding. 10, 27. The fear of the Lord prolongeth days, but the years of the wicked shall be shortened. Do you want to live a long life? How many of you here would like to live a long life? Everybody likes to live a long life. Yeah, of course we do. <laughs> well, did you hear what that just said? The fear of the Lord prolongeth days but the years of the wicked shall be shortened. You know, and we don't seem to get it. What makes you live a long life? The fear of the Lord. What makes your life shorter? <laughs> the years of the wicked shall be shortened. 1426, and the fear of the Lord is strong confidence. His children shall have a place of refuge. The fear of the Lord produ produces protection. The fear of the Lord is a fountain of life to depart from the snares of death. There it says the same thing. The fear of the Lord gives you life, but when you leave the fear of the Lord, you're heading toward death. The fear of the Lord tendeth to life, and he that hath it shall abide satisfied. He shall not be visited with evil. By humility and the fear of the Lord... Now listen, first of all, let me ask you a question. How many of you would really like to be rich? Yeah. Oh, come on. Somebody's not telling me the truth. <laughs> if you had a rich uncle who died and says, I'm going to leave all of my money to, and you put your name in that slot, uh, unless they say, I don't want to be rich. How many of you would say, I don't want to be rich? Ah, now we have honesty. <laughs> you, would, you, would want, you would want the rich uncle's money, wouldn't you? Okay, yeah, yeah. So, you got it. So, that's what, this is what it says, by humility and fear of the Lord are riches. Let it sink in. 
You got pride? That'll cut it out. You don't have the fear of the Lord? That'll cut it out. Our riches and honor and life. Fear of the Lord is rather central to everything that you might consider good in this present world. Then, number four, God commands us not to be afraid of people and circumstances because he's with us. That term, fear not, I think I mentioned it last week, it occurs 62 times in the Bible in that context. We looked at, oh, many of them last week. Uh, Genesis 1.15, after these things, the word of the Lord came, I'm just going to give you a few, unto Abram in a vision, saying, Fear not, Abram, I am thy shield and thy exceeding great reward. That's why you don't have to be afraid. He's a shield. He's a reward. The Lord appeared unto him in the same night and said, I am the God of Abraham, thy father. Fear not, for I am with thee and will bless thee and will multiply thy seed for my servant Abraham's sake. That's why we don't have to be afraid. Because he's with us. He'll bless us. He multiplies us. Deuteronomy 31.6 Be strong and of a good courage. Fear not, nor be afraid of them. For the Lord thy God, he it is that doth go with thee. He will not fail thee nor forsake thee. God never fails and he never forsakes. Never. He is always there. These are incredible promises. And the Lord, he it is that doth go before thee. He will be with thee. He will not fail thee. Neither forsake thee. Fear not. Neither be thou dismayed. And Joshua said unto them, Fear not, nor be dismayed. Be strong of a good courage. For thus shall the Lord do to all your enemies against whom you fight. Second Kings 6.16 And he answered, Fear not. For they that be with us are more than they that be with them. Now, that context. What is it? The context is Elijah in the center of the city and his servant and the enemy has surrounded the city and they're all out there yelling and shouting we're going to get you 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 and the servant is all blah, 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 like this and Elijah says you know we got more on our side than they do he looks around and he says no we don't they got a lot more out there than we got in here Elijah says oh you're not looking far enough Lord opened his eyes his eyes are open and he sees the mountains all around them filled with with flaming horses and chariots. What is the biggest army that anybody on earth could amass? Think of the biggest army that you can think of. Put all of Russia and all of China and all of North Korea and all of Iran and all of Iraq and all of Saudi Arabia and all of Lebanon and all of Turkey and all of Kuwait and all of you know, North Africa together into one army. There's a bigger army than that. The angelic hosts. They that be with us are more than they that be with them. The angelic hosts surround us. They minister to the saints. It says so in the book of Hebrews. Your people. Why would you ever be afraid? Of course, even if they weren't there, God is. But if God says, well, I'm not going to use my own hand to do it, I'll just use my angelic host to take care of you, do you think he could do it? Let's talk about how many demons does the devil have? Did you know one third of the holy angels fell and followed Satan? But that means that God's forces outnumber the devil's forces two to one. You do not need to be afraid. We serve the living God. Oh, I can't emphasize this strongly enough. And we not only serve him, but he's not an ogre. He's a God who loves us. Just remember that. He loves you more than any love you could possibly conjure up in your own mind. And it goes a million miles beyond that. Infinitely beyond that. That's the God who loves you. That's 
why you do not need to be afraid. We don't need to fear what man can do unto us. They are more that are with us than that are with them. Now, last week, I started a, a second section on that topic of fear, which was the important verses that give us specific reasons why we don't have to be afraid. Because the, the commands of God not to be afraid are not just a matter of, okay, you know, keep a stiff upper lip, you know, you, know, you hang in there, hang in. That, that's not what those commands are all about. He gives us reasons coupled with personal promises as to why we never need to be afraid. Some of these verses have two, three, and even four reasons in them. I'll give you just one or two of these. Uh, you remember, we looked at Isaiah 35 last week. Say to them that are of a fearful heart, be strong, fear not. So there, here's the problem, fearful heart. Here's the command, be strong, fear not. Here are the four reasons. Number one, your God will come with vengeance. Number two, your God will come with recompense. Number three, your God will come to save you. For God will hold thy right hand, saying, fear not, I will help thee. That's actually five, not four. Incredible promises that God gives to his people. We saw many in Isaiah. That's a, a book full of promises to those who are fearful. Isaiah is loaded with them, and we looked at many of those last week. Fear not, O my servant Jacob, be not dismayed. I will save thee from afar off. None shall make him afraid. It's wonderful promises of God, and they are made for you. Now, today, I want to move into the New Testament. It's all new material. I want to move into the New Testament and develop the theme that we started last week with specific reasons that we're not to fear and the specific blessings for being fulfilled with faith. So we're looking at New Testament verses. Last week was Old Testament. This week is New Testament. Now, let's look at some of the people that were afraid in the New Testament, and then let's look at why they didn't have to be afraid. Let's start with uh, Joseph. You've heard of Joseph, right? You know who Joseph is? No, no, I'm not talking about Genesis 50. I'm talking about, I'm talking about Matthew chapter 1, verse 20. While he thought on these things, behold, the angel of the Lord appeared unto him in a dream, saying, Joseph, thou son of David, what are the next two words? Fear not. Joseph, thou son of David, fear not. Why do you think it mentions thou son of David? Why did the angel remind him of that reason? Joseph was in the messianic line that gave legal right to the throne. He was not in the messianic line that gave physical right to the throne, but he was in the messianic line that gave legal right to the throne. Thou son of David, it's a reminder of his great heritage. It's a reminder of the great king who had ruled over Israel. It's a reminder that he can look back and say, Wow, God, let me be a descendant of that man. How many of you here would like to be physical descendants of King David? Wouldn't it be cool? Yeah. <laughs> That'd be fun, wouldn't it? You say, Man, <laughs> well, yeah, yeah, yeah. I know you've got Charlemagne in your background, and, uh, and by the way, I do. Uh, but uh, I've got David in my background. Who's better, Charlemagne or David? We all say David. Absolutely. You know? Thou son of David. Now, listen to the next part. Fear not to take unto thee Mary thy wife. Listen to the next phrase. For that which is conceived in her is of the Holy Ghost. We're dealing with a very intimate personal relationship here. We're dealing with the issue of marriage. We're dealing with a very specific marriage. We're dealing with a prophesied marriage. And we're dealing with the fulfillment of a prophesied marriage to come about with the birth of the Messiah. Fear not to take unto thee Mary thy wife for that which is conceived in her. You can rule out all men. That which is conceived in her is of the Holy Ghost. You know, there's a general principle that we can derive from this. 
something that we can see how it applies to us. You say, well, yeah, but, you know, we're not in the line of David. Uh, the Messiah has already come, so we're not going to be in the line of the Messiah. So I guess there's nothing here for me. No. That which is conceived in her is of the Holy Ghost. We're dealing with a personal relationship. Here's the principle. Personal relationships that God has ordained are holy. If it's outside the will of God, which means it's contrary to the word of God, it is not holy. Personal relationships that God has ordained, and he never ordains anything contrary to his word, those relationships are holy. Let's look at another passage over to Matthew chapter 10, verse 28. And fear not them which kill the body, but are not able to kill the soul, but rather fear him which is able to destroy both soul and body in hell. Now, of course, the obvious thing is we have immediately a contrast between the fear of man and the fear of God. The fear of man, don't fear those that can kill the body. Other people can kill you. Did you know that? <laughs> I think we all know that. We see that happening all over the world today. Somebody could walk in that door right now, aim a gun at me, pull the trigger, and blow me from here to heaven. You know, wouldn't even take a very big bullet to do it. And that would be my escort to heaven. I don't have to be afraid. Somebody might do it. Someday somebody might do it. Somebody might come in and shoot every one of us here in this auditorium. But he says you don't have to be afraid of them. Fear not them which kill the body, but are not able to kill the soul. That is the worst thing that men can do to you. Kill you. Means you have no more hope for doing anything in this life. I mean, if they torture you, that's not very pleasant. But at least you might have a hope of doing something profitable for the glory of God in the future once you get out of that torture situation. But they can put an end to everything you do in this life by killing you. It says, don't be afraid of them. Because all they can do is kill the body, but they cannot kill the soul. Instead, he says, rather fear him which is able to destroy both soul and body in hell. This is a verse that gives us focus to what we just established by our Old Testament study. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. It's not talking about the devil there. You know, some people say, well, yeah, I better be afraid of the devil uh, because, uh, you know, he can, he's in the spirit realm and so he might kill me uh, you know, he, he's killed other people, and, uh, you know, we saw what he did to Job. Uh, um, and he might kill my soul, too, in hell. No, the devil doesn't cast anybody into hell. Did you know that? God prepared hell for the devil and his angels. It's not the devil has got this place, and, you know, you, you got all those cartoon pictures, the devil standing in flames with a big grin on his face and a pitchfork and two horns and a red tail, and he's all red, you know. The devil is not in charge of hell. Let that sink in. God is in charge of hell. That is his place of punishment. He is the one who casts into hell, not the devil. Because someday God is going to take the devil by the scruff of the neck and he's going to throw him into hell. Hell was prepared for the devil and his angels by God. The one that you fear is you fear God. He is able to destroy both soul and body in hell. Let's look at another one, Matthew chapter 28, verse 5. And the angel answered. Here we have the resurrection going on. The angel answered and said unto the women, Fear not ye, for I know that ye seek Jesus, which was crucified. Well, there's an exciting principle here. We never have to fear when we're seeking Jesus. If your focus is on Christ, you do not have to fear. The women were stumbling through the dark, trying to find their way to the tomb, walking through a graveyard, and people today, oh, scary thing, walk through a graveyard at night. No, no, no. I don't need to worry about that. 
it's a foolish place to be at night because there may be drug addicts out there or something. But the point is, if you're going to find a grave, you don't have to be afraid. They're not ghosts out there. They're not goblins out there. They're not boogeymen out there. Those people are dead and they're either in heaven or hell. A couple of weeks ago, I had the privilege of going down here to Harley Cemetery, taking an older gentleman who is from Korea, uh, who worked with Dr. McIntyre many, many, many years ago, and who in South Korea, Dr. McIntyre put him in charge of 19 orphanages uh, in South Korea at that time. And some of you helped pack bicycles and so on to send them over at that time. Um, but I had the privilege of taking him and the editor of a Korean newspaper down to Harley Cemetery to find Dr. McIntyre's grave and to sit there at the top of the grave. But you know, Dr. McIntyre, his body's in the grave, but Dr. McIntyre's in heaven. And his wife, Fairy, is buried next to him. And there are hundreds of Bible Presbyterians all buried in the Overlook section of Harley Cemetery. And they all have flat gravestones because Dr. McIntyre wanted people to remember that when we die, we're all equal. No big monuments put up by the rich people. No little tiny monuments because the people were poor and couldn't afford anything better. All flat headstones, all flat headstones through that entire section. What a blessing to know that someday Jesus Christ will come back with the voice of the archangel, with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first, and we which are remain and alive shall be caught up together with him in the clouds evermore to be with the Lord. Wherefore, comfort one another with these words. What an incredible promise that God has made to us. They were seeking Jesus. They were going into a graveyard. The angel answered and said unto the women, Fear not ye, for I know that ye seek Jesus which was crucified. There is no fear for those who seek Christ. Luke 1.13 Here we find Zacharias. He's an old man. His wife is an old woman. They've been praying for, for a baby for years and years and years and years. They've been married a long time and they couldn't have any kids. And the angel said unto him, Fear not, Zacharias, for thy prayer is heard. And thy wife Elizabeth shall bear thee a son, and thou shalt call his name John. There's a great general principle for us out of this verse too. There is no fear to those who come to God in holy prayer with righteous requests. You can always come to God in holy prayer for righteous requests. You do not come with carnal requests. God will say no. You have not because you ask not. You ask and receive not because you ask amiss that you may consume it upon your own lust. You adulterers and adulteresses, know you not that friendship with the world is enmity with God? Why do you get no answers to your prayers? Because you don't have holy prayers. He was a righteous man. He was coming to God with holy prayer. He was told, do not be afraid. It was holy prayer and a righteous request. And the angel told him, do not be afraid. Let's look at Luke chapter 1, verse 30. Here's the angel appearing not just to Joseph, but now appearing to Mary. The angel said unto her, fear not, Mary, for thou hast found favor with God. <laughs> you know what we can derive out of that? We do not need to be afraid of the blessing of God, even if it does not seem to make sense at the time. You know, that really doesn't make sense. I mean, that's not rational. Angel says to her, you know, Mary, uh, you got a great blessing. You're going to get pregnant. Holy Ghost is going to make you pregnant. And you're going to have a baby. <laughs> and um, I don't have, I've never known a man. Yeah, yeah, that's okay. God can take care of that problem. It doesn't make any sense. But what did Mary say? She says, Behold the handmaid of the Lord, be it unto me, even as thou hast spoken. We don't have to understand everything to have faith. In fact, if you understand everything and put it together rationally, it's probably not 
faith. Sometimes it doesn't make sense, so we, but we don't need to be afraid of the blessing of God. Let me give you another one. Luke chapter 2, verse 10. The angel said unto them, This is the shepherds. Fear not. He tells the shepherds, Fear not. For behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy, which shall be to all people. <laughs> now, what principle do we get out of that? We do not need to fear the prophecies and promises of God. This book is full of of the prophecies and promises of God. When you read some of them, if, if you don't understand them, they may, might look really kind of scary. You look about here, man, you know, the, the stars are getting burned up in heaven and fall into the earth and the seas turn into blood and all. I mean, you're reading over in the book of Revelation. Sounds kind of scary. If you don't know what's going on and if you don't know, we're, <laughs> we're not going to be here for that. We do not need, God's children, do not need to be afraid of the prophecies and promises of God. Let me give you another one. Luke chapter 8, verse 50. When Jesus heard it, he answered him, saying, Fear not, only believe, and she shall be made whole. Here's a father. He's come asking Jesus to heal his daughter. Somebody runs and tells him, Your daughter just died. What do you think was in his heart? Oh, no. And Jesus says to him, Fear not. Fear not. Those are important words in times of crisis and loss. Fear not. Only believe. That takes us back to that principle we learned a little while ago. Fear is the op not only the opposite of faith, but fear prevents the fulfillment of prayer. Fear prevents the fulfillment of prayer. Do you want your prayers answered? If you're full of fear, you're going to get no for answer. Because God wants you to ask in faith. Ask in faith, nothing wavering. For he that wavereth is as a wave of the sea, driven with wind and tossed. For let not that man think that he shall receive anything of the Lord. A double-minded man is unstable in all his ways. That's what James says. If your heart is full of fear, you are not praying in faith, and you will get a no for the answer. Fear destroys everything in the Christian life. And it means you're always walking around wondering why God's not answering your prayers. How about Luke 12, 7? Jesus speaking. But even the very hairs of your head are all numbered. Fear not, therefore. Ye are of more value than many sparrows. What principle can we draw from that? I'm running through a lot of principles really fast here. I mean, we spend a lot of time on all these. But, but what principle can we get from that? You know, you're of more value than many sparrows. The hairs of your head are all numbered. When you have fear, it means you do not understand the infinite value, the infinite importance that you have to God. Do you understand that? You are infinitely important to God. I mean, get your mind around that if you can. Why would the sovereign God of the universe bother, and you think of the gigantic, vast expanses of the universe, why would the sovereign God of the universe send his son to walk around in sandals and get his feet dirty and then he washes the disciples' feet and then dies on a cross for you 2,000 years later. If you were not of infinite value to him. That's what that verse is telling us. We have an infinite importance, infinite value to God. How about Luke chapter 12, verse 32? Fear not, little flock. Even that we could spend some time on, little flock. Fear not, gigantic, mighty army. No, 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 he doesn't say that. Fear not, little flock. He's talking to his disciples. Twelve little guys. I mean, there were fewer disciples than there are people here in this room. You think about that. 
And God was going to use them to change the world. Question for you. Do you think God could use the people in this room to change the world? Amen. We got one girl of faith down here in the front. She said, yep. <laughs> Amen. If we don't obey him, do you think he's going to use us to change the world? No. Every day, you each individually have opportunity to change the world. It may be a little flock, but God is the God of small things. He loves to take the weak and the helpless and do great things. God has not chosen the mighty of the world. Paul talks about it in 1 Corinthians. He chose the weak things, the base things, the off-scourings of the world to bring to nothing. Oh, those great and mighty ones that thought they were so much. Do you understand that's why God chose us? Because we're nothing? But he takes the nothings and he changes lives. He impacts families. He impacts neighborhoods. He impacts communities. He impacts cities. He impacts states. He impacts the world with men and women who are 100% committed to him. But we learn a lot more than just that. That's just the first part of the verse. Fear not, little flock, for it is your Father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. When you have fear, it means that you don't really understand the guarantee of these incredible gifts from God. It's your Father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. Why are you afraid? If your Father's good pleasure is to give you the kingdom, Jesus says, fear not. And the reason he gives is because it's your Father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. Fear not for, that means because. You don't have to be afraid because. Your Father's good pleasure, it's not, oh, your Father's kind of stingy and he really didn't want to do it, but I guess he's going to have to squeeze that one out here because you guys are such good guys. No, that is not what it says. It's his good pleasure to give you the kingdom. Fear means that you do not understand the prophecies of God. That's incredible. All the future prophecies for the bride, the bride of Christ, the church, the things that God has promised to those that love him. Now, you know, he expects something out of us. This morning we read our passage there in the book of Exodus and God gives them four promises. If you do this, if you do this, if you do this, if you do this, I will put none of these diseases upon you which I have put upon the Egyptians. God expects us to obey him. If you are walking in disobedience, don't expect the blessings. You are not saved by your good works. You are not sanctified by your good works. But if you are saved and the Holy Spirit is moving in you, the good works will follow. And that is the progressive sanctification that ultimately leads when we step into his presence with ultimate sanctification where there's no more sin in his presence. And we stand before him complete and whole, made so by the blood of the Lamb. Ah, yes, that we would believe the promises of God. Here's another one, and here we're quoting the Old Testament, so New Testament tying together with Old Testament. John chapter 12, verse 15. Fear not, daughter of Zion, behold thy king cometh, sitting on an ass's colt. Now, that has already occurred. I'm going to be talking about that, the Lord willing, on Palm Sunday, but in a very special context. I won't give it away just yet, because I don't want you to, to try to look it up ahead of time. But there's some very special stuff that I've never preached on before here at this church in relation to that Palm Sunday entry. And the Lord willing, we'll see that on Palm Sunday. But back to our text here. Fear not, daughter of Zion. Behold, thy king cometh sitting on an ass's colt. Now, Zechariah wrote that because it was to be a point of courage so that Israel, going through all of the different 
times of testing that led up to that point where Jesus made his triumphal entry into the city where they did not have to be afraid. Oh, they'd had all kinds of battles with armies going back and forth, trampling down their land, killing Jews, destroying their cities. And many of them probably wondered, I wonder if God will really fulfill these promises literally or if it's only a figurative kind of thing to sort of make us feel good. God fulfilled it literally. He fulfilled it precisely. He fulfilled it to the day. They did not have to be afraid. They waited. They waited a long time. But God is never late. Did you know that? Oh, we wish it would come sooner. We're the instant, you know, microwave kind of people. We want the toaster tart to pop up. At, you know, come on, come on, come on. Pop up, pop up. You know. But God's not like that. He lives in eternity. In the fullness of time. God sent forth his son, made of a woman, made under the law, to redeem them that are under the law. All the way through scripture, we're told that God has a precise plan. He marches down history with precision and does everything at exactly the right time and never makes a mistake. Fear not, daughter of Zion, behold, thy king cometh. Well, fear means that you don't understand the prophecies of God. But you know, we can take that even further because we have a promise of Christ's return for us. Israel is spoken of here. Fear not, daughter of Zion, behold, thy king cometh. And we're told how the king was going to come the first time. He was going to be meek and lowly and sitting upon an ass and want a colt, the foal of an ass. Zechariah says so. But he's coming again. And that gives us reason not to be afraid. No matter how bad the world gets, you know, we are not going to destroy the planet. This morning I got up, I flipped on the radio, heard some interview with some lady who's a marine biologist who does lots of scuba diving and all this kind of stuff. And she was talking about she doesn't even eat fish because, you know, we're wiping out the fish on planet Earth. It's like, oh, come on. It's like, okay, okay. Yeah. I mean, that, that's going a lot farther than the people who say, well, we, you know, we got to save the whales. Well, she wants to save the fish, too. She shouldn't eat fish. Okay, that's all right. But, you know, we are not going to come to the end of the world that way. We're not going to wipe out all uh, animal life and all marine life, and we're all going to sit around starving, munching on oak leaves or something. It's not going to happen. We're told how it's going to happen, though, how the end of the world is going to come, but we're told that we're going to be out of here when that judgment falls on earth. A lot of people are going to do a lot of wicked things. They're going to do bad things to Christians, just like they've done bad things to Jews all through the centuries. They're going to do it to us too. And I hope you're picking up on that in what's going on in the United States right now today. I'm not going to cover that today. But, I mean, there are dozens of cases right now where Christians are coming under severe persecution here in the United States. And nothing's being done about it, except for a few Christian legal organizations that handle those cases, but they still have to go through it. They still have to go through the trials. They still have to go through the wading through of multiple papers and going and sitting in court and listening to people berate them. Bad things can happen to us people. We expect that. But we do not need to be afraid because behold, thy king cometh. He's coming again. He's coming for us. We'll be caught up in a moment in the twinkling of an eye at the last trump. And we'll evermore be with the Lord. Wherefore, comfort one another with these words. 1 Corinthians 15, verses 52 through 58. All right, let's take one out of Acts. We're almost out of time. Acts 27, 24. Saying, fear not, Paul, Thou must be brought before Caesar, and lo, God hath given thee all them that sail with thee. Now, you, some of you were here when I preached through the book of Acts, and preached, uh, that, that was a fun time to preach about the, the ships sailing there and throwing stuff overboard, and, you know, the horrendous storm, Eurachlodon, and, uh, I mean, we learned a lot of things about, you know, God's sovereign will and directing that ship so there would be a great revival someplace where there would not have been if the ship had sailed directly to Rome and all those kinds of things. But we have a very important lesson here related to fear. Fear not Paul. There are two things in the verse and one application. 
The first thing in the verse is the sovereignty of God. Thou must be brought before Caesar. What's the first reason here that we don't have to be afraid? Because the sovereign will of God is going to be accomplished even when everything is totally out of control. None of us have ever been in a situation where everything, everything was totally out of control. Number two, not just the sovereignty of God, but God said, I'm going to give you something whereby you can look at it and see whether or not I'm lying to you. Did you see the second thing? Lo, God hath given thee all them that sail with thee. Now that was a pretty big storm, and that was not a very big boat. Nothing like the gigantic ocean liners that we have today. And there were sailors running around on the deck trying to strap stuff down. Not one of them is going to get washed overboard. Not one of them is going to get hit in the head with a boom from the mast. Not one of them is going to feel so, so sick that he dies of a heart attack. God has given you all them that sail with thee. The Apostle Paul then stood up and gave a witness. You know what? I suspect, I don't know for sure, but I suspect that that little phrase, God hath given thee all them that sail with thee, might not only be a reference to the physical life of all those people on board, but that through that experience and Paul's testimony, God drew them to Christ. We might see a whole shipload of people in heaven who sailed with Paul on that voyage because Paul was encouraged and was not afraid. And he bore testimony which they saw was fulfilled exactly. He said, we're going to have to be shipwrecked, but God's going to spare everybody's life. They saw it when they were washed up on the island. They saw it when the, the snake bit Paul's hand and he shook it off into the fire. They saw him when, when he healed Publius' father and then many people from the island being healed and the whole shipload was there. Many were saved on that island. I suspect the entire shipload was among them. But it tells us something else too. Fear not Paul. Even great Christian leaders can be afraid. That's always a warning to those of us who are in positions of leadership. There can be always something that makes us afraid. But God's command to us is fear not. Because God guarantees that nothing can happen to us until his time for us to come home to heaven has arrived. The day of your death has been appointed. You can't change it. The day of your death has been appointed. Scripture says so. We do not have to be afraid of anything, even of death. We can march boldly forward until God says, come home. Takes our hand, draws us to heaven. Just keep marching boldly forward because God is sovereign. One final verse, our time is up. Revelation 1.17. And when I saw him, this is John, in the Son of Man vision, Revelation chapter 1. And when I saw him, I fell at his feet as dead. And he laid his right hand upon me, saying unto me, Fear not, I am the first and the last. Here's John, the beloved disciple. Here's John, who leaned on Jesus' bosom at the Last Supper. Here's John who asks the question, who is it, Lord, that's going to betray you? Here's John who is walking along when Peter is being told by Jesus, Peter, do you love me? And Peter says, yeah, yeah, I'm pretty fond of you. 
Well, Peter, do you love me? Uh, yeah, I'm, I, I like you a lot. Peter, do you love me? And he says, well, do you even like me a lot? He uses the word for that on that last question. And uh, then Jesus tells Peter how he's going to die. And Peter turns around and says, Lord, but what about this man? And Jesus says, what is it to you if I will that he tarry till I come? And John, in his letter in that final chapter says well and the disciples thought that that meant that maybe John would live until Jesus came back but that's not what Jesus said John makes it clear that that's not what Jesus said he says what is it to you in other words it's none of your business we always want to know about other people don't we we always want to know what about that guy what about this guy well you're talking to me but what about them you're telling me to love you but what about them he's not talking to them he's talking to you don't always be wondering about somebody else. Wonder, how does this apply to me? But the thing that we learn, fear not, I am first and last. John, who knew Jesus so well. Fear means we don't really understand who Jesus is. We don't really understand who Jesus is. John, who's so close, fell down as dead and was afraid. You know, that's a serious indictment, I think, for all of us that shows we don't understand his love for us. Oh, it's true that he's the sovereign judge of the church. He's the ruler of the universe. But we really don't understand his love for us. Our gracious Heavenly Father, we pray that you will teach us about your love how much you love us. Indeed, you are sovereign, and we do not have to be afraid. But your sovereign love for us. It's an amazing thought. Help us to understand it more and more every day. And as a result of understanding your love, to learn to walk by faith and to cast out all fear. Perfect love casts out fear. Love is not made perfect in fear. Help us, Father, to love you more. For we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Our closing hymn for today is number 588.